let me introduce our panelists. Let me start with Jeff, the film's director and producer. So um, Jeff and I met back in sometime 2004, five-ish. Um, he lived in Twain House, one of the residences where my wife and I are resident fellows. We were for years. Um, somebody out there squeak Twain House? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, oh, right. so we, we met him. He was uh, you know, very active in the house. He and his group of friends. Um, we liked him so much we hired him to be an RA the following year as an assistant. So <clears throat> we always knew him as a very uh, intelligent, of course, but very creative guy. He played the piano. He sang with Talisman. He was a photographer. Yeah. I mean, he was involved <laughs> in a lot of things at Stanford. It sounds like a Stanford student to me. So he graduated, and years later, he'd come by and he'd visit. And one time uh, he visited, he was telling my wife and I about a project he was working on. He was helping film um, ice melt. And he was very excited about it, talking about his experience in going to Iceland and Greenland. And he laughed, and my wife and I said, oh, he's filming ice melt, huh? Hmm, interesting. <laughs> but if he's excited about it, I guess it's a cool project. Little did we know what he was actually doing. And so years later, here he is as the director of, uh, of this incredible, incredible film. I think we'd all agree. So um, Jeff will say a few words, um, but let me introduce our other panelists as well. So uh, to my far left, we have uh, Professor Noah Diffenbraugh, and these faculty members are all uh, fellows of the uh, Woods Institute. Uh, Dr. Diffenbra's research interests are centered uh, on the dynamics and impacts of climate variability and change, um, including the role of humans as a coupled component of the climate system. Uh, much of, the, of his work is focused on the role of fine-scale processes in shaping phenomena such as extreme weather, climate vegetation, feedbacks, atmospheric forcing, uh, forces of the coastal ocean change, and so on. Um, He's a professor of earth sciences. Uh, to his right is uh, Professor Terry Root, whose <clears throat> work is in biology. Her primary work is on large scale ecological questions that focus on the impacts of global warming. She actively works at uh, making specific information accessible to decision makers and the public. For example, she's been the lead author for the um, intergovernmental panel on climate change, uh, third and fourth assessment reports. So she dumbs it down for us, I think is what that means. Um, uh, professor uh, Michael Wara is professor of law and uh, his research focuses on climate policy and regulation, both uh, domestically and internationally. Uh, professor Wara's current scholarship addresses the performance of the emerging global market for greenhouse gases and mechanisms for uh, reducing emissions especially in developing countries after the Kyoto Protocol expires in uh, 2012. So Jeff, if you can say something about uh, the making of the film, and also Jeff, if you can um, tell us if you feel that the movie has made a difference in general. For uh, example, there's a testimonial on your website that says that a uh, denier, a non-believer, went uh, to the movie to get a good laugh and uh, came out with a completely different outlook on what we're doing with our planet. Yeah, thank you, Arcadio. Um, uh, it's just really, first of all, it's really awesome to screen Chasing Ice here at Stanford. Um, I really got involved in film uh, through a workshop through the Stanford Film uh, Society as an undergrad. Um, that's, that was really my first exposure to film, and that's where I fell in love with it. And uh, to kind of come back all these years later and screen it here is really, really cool for me. Um, there was a shot of Twain in the movie. I don't know if you noticed it. There's one <laughs> shot where I, I feel like I'm a different person in that movie with the interviews. Um, but there's a shot where I had the ice axes and crampons, and that's oh, the yeah. Twain hallway yeah, right there. Um, uh, so it's it's just it's been five years working on this film, and it's something where um, I went to Iceland on my spring break of senior year. I went to Greenland uh, the two weeks before graduation. Um, the flights coming back from Greenland are once a week, and we had we were stuck in Greenland next to this glacier when the weather turned really really bad, and the helicopter couldn't come and pick us up and bring me back to the town. So the next day, the helicopter was able to come and get me and brought me back. And I just made the once a week flight. Uh, and I got back, into, got back to Stanford like, I don't know, a couple hours after my parents had already gotten here the day before graduation. So it was cutting it close. Um, 
In, in terms of impact, uh, we've been really blown away and humbled by the response to the film. Um, the intention wasn't to make a movie to, that was going to affect change. Uh, our goal really was to make a movie um, that would share James's story. Um, let me actually take a step back because when we first started working on it, the goal wasn't to make a movie at all. Um, my original role was to follow James, to be a videographer, just to document what he was doing, to travel with him to Iceland and Greenland and to keep capturing footage of his travels and adventures. Um, the purpose was YouTube videos, promotional materials, so he could fundraise with those video assets. Um, and it was really about a year and a half into the project when I finally got his green light to make the film. And he kind of came around and recognized the potential of that. So at that point, the, the goal really was to make a movie that would just showcase uh, James's photography and, and the time lapses. Um, and after we started getting a, a strong response to the film, uh, the mindset now is that we want the film to continue to make change and, and have influence over people. Um, we've had a number of screenings where uh, people have said, you know, they were completely uh, in denial about the issue that they, you know, had heard from the news or from various sources, uh, all sorts of conflicting information. They didn't know where to stand, and that the film, the 75-minute experience, shifted their stance on the issue. Um, so we've been really, really just blown away and humbled by that response. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Thank you, Jeff. Um, <clears throat> Let me get into the politics a bit, uh, Professor Wara, if you will. Can you talk about whether or not that there, there's hope that the Obama administration, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, or even Congress will implement something that will help decrease the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere at some point in our lifetime? Well, I'm glad my question was easier. <laughs> you know, I mean, one of, the, one of the really frightening things about greenhouse gases is we can't really reduce the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere in our lifetime, right? The, the oceans and very slow geologic processes will eventually do that long after we're gone. Um, but we can, what we can do is stop making the problem worse. And there is, um, there are a number of efforts underway uh, within the administration to begin to address the problem. And I think the, what's on the table right now, and this is, this is the Obama administration, and in particular the EPA, is really just, just the beginning. Um, but it's important that we make that beginning because um, an enormous number of other countries around the world really look to the United States to, to as a leader, um, as a leader uh, in terms of not just environmental policy, but in, in terms of lifestyle and um, a model for what it means to live a good life. And so we need to show the world how to do that and not you know, destroy the, not just the glaciers, which are really an early warning system, a canary in the coal mine, as, as uh, was said in the movie, um, but, but a much broader set of environmental concerns. So, Professor Root, you were one of the uh, the speakers on the film, and you mentioned something about uh, extinction. And so, why would uh, plants and animals be facing extinction now when we've dealt with changing temperatures in prehistoric times? What? Well, the world has always seen changes in in temperatures. It's been very extreme um, at times, but the thing that's different now is is that we have freeways and farms and factories all over the planet and the species are trying to move and pass through those. So what's happening is the species are moving toward the poles and up the mountains. Well, if they're trying to move and they run into, I wouldn't want to be a turtle, for instance, trying to cross a, across the New Jersey tur Turnpike, for instance. How does that turtle get across the New Jersey Turnpike? That's what we're really running into, is trying to figure out how, that, how we can help that. And humans are gonna to have to be part of the solution. We can't just sit back and, and let it happen. We've got to go out and, and actually help them to, um, to move. The other thing that is very, very unusual now than before is on the global average, the rate at which it is warming is astronomically faster than it ever has been. Now, it has been that fast in particular locations, but I'm now talking about the whole globe, and it really is going fast. So we talk about animals can, can evolve and, and get used to a new situation, but this one is so fast, they really can't. So we are going to lose a lot of species. We are going to have a lot of extinctions, 
but we can do something about it. We can actually go in and help the, the plants and animals. We're going to have to do that. And we've got to somehow get off of our addiction on, on oil. And that we can do, too. Uh, <clears throat> Professor Diffenbaugh, uh, James Bellog said something about this in the film. But what, what about the models? What are the models saying about Maltine ice in Greenland and the Western Arctic ice sheet? And um, what is it saying about the resulting sea level rise? Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I chuckled a little bit when he, in the beginning when he said that he, he got away from her science because he, it was all statistics and, and computer models. And <laughs> that's, we, that's more or less what we do all day, every day. Yeah. Um, <laughs> true. We screened it for an audience of scientists, and the entire room just broke out in the lab. So you know the the uh, the the physics of of these large ice sheets uh, at the poles in Antarctica and and Greenland um, present some of the biggest challenges for our understanding of, of the physical climate system. And um, we we saw in the movie the the moulins or the water the water going down the ice sheet melting and going down, and, and there was the animation of it making it down to the base. And, and um, one of the real increases in understanding over the last five, seven years has been the effect of that melting on, on the um, ice dynamics and um, how that water can, can lubricate the base of the ice sheet. And so one of, the, one of the big concerns in terms of sea level rise now is uh, how much of that ice may become mobilized from the melting. Uh, and it, it, one of the scientists mentioned uh, the tipping point, uh, essentially once, once a threshold is crossed, is it possible to, to return back to that original state um, through by reversing the pathway? And once the, you think a lot of the leading experts in that area in terms of the ice, ice sheet dynamics at, at this point are pretty convinced that if there's a point where where that uh, sliding is really accelerated, then we could see large, uh, really large contributions of that land ice in, into the ocean. And um, you know, the sea level rise has has a couple of components. The the there's thermal expansion, and you know this if you just have hot water in your teacup and and you let it cool on the counter that you, you can see visually the water actually go down. Uh, so just the warming of the ocean uh, has has causes some expansion. Um, but then there's also this ice that's up on land, and it's, it, that's water that's, that's being trapped outside of the ocean. And if that melts, as it melts and, and goes into the, to the ocean, that's new water adding, adding to the volume. And that's where the real, where the real large sea level rise uh, is likely to come from if it does occur, is, the, is from that land ice contribution. Thank you. Um, we have mics on either side of the room. If folks have questions for any of our panelists, now would be a time to... Approach the mic, line up, or you know, I can call on you. You know. <laughs> I'm reminded of an old uh, adage that if you can't change someone's beliefs, you have to transform the believer. And I think that uh, this 75-minute film is transformative from that point of view. Thank Questioners, you. you get a, a free poster. If you come up later, Jeff will sign it for you. I'll come up right now. The, the other, we'll the get other you thing, up there. I haven't forgotten. The other thing that I want to say about all that is you have to realize we were watching all of these things going on. Jeff was the one who was taking the pictures of all the things that we were watching. So here are these people out there in this horrible, horrible that was the fun windstorm. Part. <laughs> that was, yeah, like, oh, it was cold. And he, he had to have somehow gotten down low enough to take some of those yeah. pictures this way uh, along that crevice. And I must say, I am really glad I'm not married to James Baylog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we thought Baylog was nuts. Jeff was there, right? With yeah, him. I had to be ahead of him often. And uh, fortunately, I, I hate giving him a hard time about this, but. He's he's now 60 years old, so it was easier for me when I was like 24, just trying to keep up with him, because he'd you know get tired at the end of the day, and I get to rest and spend more time doing you know what I needed to. But um, the, honestly, why I wanted to get involved in the first place was for those adventures to go out into the field and to to have a you know have those ex experiences of a lifetime. Yeah, truly. Question. Uh, thank you for the film. I have a comment, I guess, about 
politics, even though no one wants to talk about politics, but there comes a point, as far as I'm concerned, that you have to start shaming people. I mean, there is a party that is roadblocking all this, and nobody wants to say, name it. It's called the Republican Party. Now, if you're a Republican, <laughs> I think you have a responsibility to, change, to, to prevent those leaders from blocking all this, because no matter how many beautiful films are done, and there have been more than this one, um, they will refute all of this, and they've managed to pull down, between the media empire that, that, they, that works for them or they work for, they are preventing this crisis from being addressed. And you, we talk about leadership in the United States. The scientists are on one side, and, they're, and, and leaders who are rational are on the, other, on, 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 the, on the side, and it is the Republicans. I'm sorry. If you're a Republican, I'm sorry, but this is your responsibility to change your party. And, and so, and, and scientists should be naming names. You, there, there comes a time when you have to shame people. And anyway, thank you for your film, but I think yeah. we have to face up to, to, to confronting those who are blocking any, any progress. Yeah, thank you for the comment. <laughs> Um, Comments? It, it's a particularly difficult issue. It's hard to get people to want to make change if you are kind of confronting them in, in that sort of fashion. What we were trying to do with the film is to present things in almost an irrefutable you know, presentation. Like, you, this is what's going on. Take a look at what's happening. And you can make your own assessment as to you know, what may or may not be happening on the planet. Um, our mindset, um, I, I often make this analogy to slavery. Um, you know, there was a period in American history where we had a, an economic system, an economic model that was based on something that we look at today as being unethical. Um, but companies said, you know, there are corporations that said, how can you take away our, our workforce? This is our labor force. This is how we make our money. This is how we make our living. And the entire, you know, country was driven on that model. Um, but there was a political debate. We had a war over it. 600,000 people died. And ultimately, we moved down a path of what we look at as being the ethical route. Um, and I, I think that we're facing a similar uh, situation today. Um, we recognize, the scientists recognize that this is a, a reality, that there are dire consequences if we continue the status quo, um, that even though our system of economic prosperity it has currently been based on it, we can still switch to a different system that can make us just as much money in different ways. Uh, we just need to set the, set the stakes in the right way, and we need to stack the deck in the right way. Um, so that, that's my perspective on it. Um, I, I look at I look at this really as being an opportunity for Republican leaders to stand up and you know, stick their necks out and represent that they see the future side of history. They see where this trajectory is going. They see where the science is going. And they can embrace the reality of the science and try and move us forward. Um, one of the, the difficulties here is that um, inherently, the actions that are required to do something about this issue involve more regulation. Um, I don't see, foresee any way around that, that simple reality. And so it's less the Republican Party, and from my understanding, it's more of these somewhat um, kind of separate groups that are funded uh, very well through uh, people of certain mindsets that are trying to actively prevent um, bigger government, trying to actively prevent uh, regulations on corporations. So when that system has so much influence and so much power, um, they, can, they can buy a lot of weight uh, with, with those funds to confuse the public over it. It's been revealed it's the same people that use the same tactics with the cigarette an industry in the 70s. The same companies, the same people are using the same tactics to confuse the public about climate change. And they don't need to get people to you know, deny the reality of it. They just need people to question the reality of it. So if people aren't sure as to whether or not it's true, if they can keep wondering, well, I hear this and I hear that. Um, I was on a, on a plane flight the other day, and I heard two people sitting next to me talking about how it was all a hoax. And I engaged them in conversation. And I was just trying to hear what they had to say, like what their mindset was in, in that perspective that they had. And clearly, it's just coming from all sorts of misinformation that they're receiving from the media, from, from various places. And that's, that's their success. You know, the, or, the organizations that don't want us to make progress, all they need to do is confuse the public. And what we're trying to do with the film is bring clarity and, and information and, and the truth to the public. So that's our stance. Yes. Go ahead. Well, I, think, I mean, I think the, the film is, is awesomely successful in that. Um, I, mean, I think as a scientist, I think I tend to probably confuse the public 
with my <laughs> answers, right? I mean, I've, I've talked about basal sliding, and I've talked about you know the energy distribution on the planet and whatnot, right? And I think just that, um, so that, you know, I think as, as scientists, I don't, I don't know how much we help, but um, <laughs> the movie is really, I mean, for me, you know, you, we we can talk about what's the likelihood of the of the Greenland ice sheet, um, you know, mobilizing or or West Antarctica or whatever, and and um, you can frame that in some kind of risk management framework or something. Um, but just you know, kind of watching, watching those time lapse videos, it's you know, you it's everyone can make their own choice about you know what how they what they want to do to avoid more of that uh, if that I mean, yeah. if that's what they prefer. But I think it makes a really clear um, it, it's some really clear observations. There was a an article just this past week that actually interviewed a man named John Mashey, who, who lives right here in Palo Alto, actually in Portola Valley. And he has, has dug up different tax records and has found how much money these people are actually putting into trying to give us disinformation so that we are confused. And I really urge you to go on the web and look up John Mashey and read this article. It, it really gives you an understanding of how important this seems to be to make it so confusing to all these people. There's, there's something at stake there. Thank you. If, you know, yeah. I, I just, I want to differ a little bit with the, what's been said in the, in the following respect. Um, I think people do, there are certainly people and there are a loud and vocal minority that basically don't believe in any of this. Um, but my experience with going to talk to members of Congress about this problem and, and people who are from the Republican Party in particular, because ultimately to move legislation, you need Republican votes, right? Unless things really change, you need to get to 60 in the Senate. And it's all about getting to 60. And so... When you, when you talk to people, the people who might swing, who, who, who you could cr conceivably think might be persuaded to support a particular set of policies, um, that they are very concerned about trade-offs. And they're very concerned about the, you know, for example, the low-cost energy that certain, certain regions of the country enjoy. We pay the highest electricity prices other than Hawaii in the country. Other parts of the country have very low electricity prices, and that supports industry. That supports auto manufacturing, for example. We make Teslas in California, but odds are, well, maybe some of you own a Tesla. It is mm -hmm. Palo Alto. But <laughs> you know, most people's cars that get made in America are made in the southeast, and there is a reason for that. And a, and a part of that, there are a set of reasons, really, but a big part of the reason is low energy costs driven by coal. And so the, the folks who are rational, right, who, who, be, who maybe not rational is wrong, or believe expert consensus, expert scientific consensus, but are still reluctant to support the policies necessary to start doing something about climate change, are really worried about those trade-offs. And, you know, if you want to see that, question writ even larger, go to a developing country, right? I mean, ultimately, what we do, what we don't do, it matters, but it's, it's like rounding error in comparison to what China and India decide or don't decide to do. And so part of what our role is is to show those countries how to do this, how to be wealthy and wealth creating and, and opportunity creating for our children and also not destroy the planet, atmospherically speaking, and clim climatologically. Um, but when you go to those countries, the trade-offs are so much more stark. You know, I mean, people, ch the Chinese economic miracle, as dirty as it is, as polluted as it is, is a story of lifting, say, 300 million people out of subsistence agriculture in the last 20 to 30 years. And those people, their lives aren't so great. You know, they're working 12 hours at the Foxconn plant in Shenzhen making our crap, right, basically. But their children, those people dream that their children will go to college, right? And, and so when they talk about climate change, what they're thinking is, well, you know, do I, do I put at risk that future for my children? And, you know, without us having very credible answers about that where we've, we've gone out and done it, right? We've shown how to do it. 
without us having those answers, it's really hard to say to someone like that, you know, or the Chinese negotiator, which is the, actually the person I talked to, but this is, this is what informs their political sensibility, you know, you, you need to do something different than what we do. Right? And what we do is we burn coal, we burn natural gas, you know, all of the above. Um, so it's a tough conversation, is my, it's not, the, the trade-offs are very real both nationally in terms of the different regions of our country and, um, and especially internationally. Thank you. Go here on the right. Hi, thank you for such a beautiful film. Um, I guess I want to ask a question that focuses on the filmmaking process more yeah, on please. the, mm -hmm. so Jeff, I guess this is directly related to your expertise. Um, I'm curious, how exactly did you get involved with the project? Were you like an undergraduate majoring in Earth Systems? Like how did you make that yeah. direct connection? And also, um, what was your day-to-day -day process like? I meant, I, um, in some of the shots, there were some parts where the camera was positioned in a way that was a place where the climbers themselves weren't there yet. So, like, for instance, when they were going into the, oh, my gosh, what's the term for Hold those on. big holes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like, there were some angles that they were below the climbers. And I was just wondering what your process like right, with right, all the right. different cameras. Stuff like that. Sure. Anyway. Um, so I was an anthropology major here, um, and I did <laughs> film just as a personal passion and hobby. And I met James through a mutual friend, and I really wanted to work with him because of, uh, I had a background in still photography. So I wanted to learn from him and as, as a still photographer. I just wanted to shadow him and follow him around. And that was really how all of it started. Um, I went with him on, on specific trips. So we went to Iceland for about one or two weeks. Uh, we went to Greenland for a couple weeks, and then Alaska. And over the course of the first six months or so, it was just a handful of those trips. Um, and like I said, we weren't planning on making a movie. We were just collecting this footage. Um, soon after that, I, I was basically pitching him on uh, letting me build the time lapses for him. Um, so I started editing the time lapses. He was shipping me hard drives from Colorado, um, and I was living in Palo Alto still, and I was editing off of these little portable hard drives that he had sent me, and I was basically creating the process, the workflow for doing all of those time lapses. Um, that's when we had a lot of the technical problems over the first year. Um, and then that fall, uh, I went to Colorado, which is where he's based, uh, and I was supposed to spend three months there, and then three months turned into four months, into six months, and I've been living there now for six years. Um, I, I love it there. I do miss the Bay Area, but um, I, Colorado's a beautiful place to live. And uh, I started just editing for him and constantly doing the time lapses and starting to work with the other footage. So it was this very slow, organic process of uh, continuing down that path. And it was probably a year, a year and a half or two years into it when I, I kept telling him he was spending so much time doing lectures and traveling and showing people. And I tried to like frame it to him like, we can make a movie and that can travel around and you don't have to travel as much. And we can show the time lapses to people and, and tell the whole story and tell the adventure and the behind the scenes that nobody gets to hear about. Um, so we finally kind of came around to that and we started working on the movie and we were building a team around that. Um, out in the field, I did most of the shooting myself. Uh, there were a couple trips where we had a second camera operator um, and on rare trips, we had a dedicated sound guy. Um, so far, and Adam always had kind of small, a small little HV20, a little H HDV camera that they would use once in a while. Um, that the big Mulan scene uh, was something that worked out kind of fortuitously. Um, we went the first day we were there. We were just scouting around. We were looking for how we were going to approach it, which side of the glacier we wanted to go down, um, checking out everything from a safety perspective, rigging the anchors. You can see everybody's anchored into three different anchors. There are three separate um, V threads. They're called huge V threads, um, where you're using the actual column of ice as an anchor. Uh, so everybody's tied into three of those, and then they're being belayed by another person who's in another set of three anchors. So it's very, very like. Relatively safe. Uh, <laughs> I did once fall like about 10 feet next to that hole, um, and then the right rope caught me. But um, uh, so the first day we were there, we went down. Uh, so the first day we just set up the anchors. The second day we went down and we shot. James got his photographs. I went down. I, I got a bunch of video. Um, I didn't know what it was going to look like going, like looking over that hole. So I just set the camera to some auto settings. I set it to autofocus. I almost never do that. Um, and my foot was right up to that crack. Um, and literally, I had my foot there, I had the tripod stretched out as long as possible, and I swung the tripod out over my knee so it could look straight down. Um, and I was there for as long as I possibly could. We all went back into the tent and we were reviewing everything, and all of my footage was, was terrible. Um, <laughs> the waterfall was 
uh, kicking up all this moisture, all this water, and it was landing on the lens. And the camera focused on those water droplets on the lens. <laughs> and so I had these really, really beautiful drops of water and a very <laughs> blurry background. Um, and so I was really upset with what I got. Um, and fortunately, James was completely un like, unpleased with his photographs. Um, and he wanted to go back the next day, so I didn't even mention it. Um, <laughs> so, so we went back a second day. Actually, um, we, we tried to cut around it carefully. The first day we're going down, Adam is wearing a blue jacket. Um, and James decided that you couldn't see the blue from the blue glacier. So the second day we went back, Adam was wearing a yellow jacket. So if you ever see the film again, like there's a scene where you see Adam wearing this blue jacket. He's going down. Then we cut away to a bunch of other stuff. And then miraculously, Adam's wearing this yellow jacket. <laughs> and he's got everything strapped on over him. And it's like securely tied in. Um, so we went back for a third day of shooting, and James wasn't happy again, and then we went back for a fourth day of shooting. <laughs> so spending four days in that location, it gave me a lot of time to just shoot everything that was going on from a lot of different angles. Um, and realistically, we were I felt very safe the whole time we were there. Um, James has lost about 14 friends out in the field due to climbing accidents or to light aircraft accidents. So James has a level of safety that is of uh, I don't know, like a paranoia far beyond myself. Um, so with that mindset and with his experience, um, I think all of us really tried to keep um, the whole team as safe as possible. You're only as, as strong as the weakest link. You know, you're only, your life, if you fall into a crevasse, your life is dependent on your friend rescuing you and pulling you out. So everybody went through training. Everybody had that level of skill and experience. We took things very, you know, carefully and meticulously when we were in those risky scenarios. Um, but it still felt intense, and that's that's kind of how we treated it in the editing process, using leveraging all the footage that we had from multiple days of different angles and trying to make it feel like like that experience. Oh, thanks. So. Well, um, speaking of mountaineering, I noticed you now have a you have a camera on Mount Everest. Yeah. And I'm also aware that the global that the uh, climate science in the Himalayan region is particularly complex and perhaps uh, particularly muddled. So sort of double question, what's the, what is the specific EIS camera revealing? Yeah. And then uh, for some of our professors, uh, what's, the, what's the cutting edge right now in terms of uh, climate science? Is Everest melting? Um, I, I didn't set up the cameras at Everest, and I haven't been there before, and I'm not super familiar with all the, the, the geographic locations there. But there are five cameras there. They've been shooting for about two or three years now. Um, the change is pretty remarkable. Even in the first couple days, they were seeing the glacier flow at a kind of dramatic, impressive rate. Um, so those those glaciers are uh, they are changing, and the, the biggest concern there is with throughout the entire Himalaya is that so many people there are dependent that on that ice for water. Um, it is a major, major issue. And when they're losing that glacial base, um, the ability for the glaciers to kind of replenish and keep water flowing throughout the year is, is greatly at risk. Uh, I don't know if you guys can add or comment to that. Well, certainly the, um, yeah, the, the, there was a lot of attention um, a couple years ago to the, to the uh, one, one particular statement um, in the IPCC fourth assessment report about uh, kind of time scale for for Himalayan glaciers, um, and you know, I'd say that the science has advanced quite a bit in the last couple of years. There have been there have been uh, a number of of um, kind of surveys of the both literature and of of existing data from remote sensing and 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 in situ you know in, in the field data. Um, <laughs> You know, one of the one of the complex issues with the Himalaya is that that the topography is very complex, and you know, really with with melting, um, there's there's some there's some subtlety to it, but for the most part, you know, water freezes below the freezing point of water, and it melts above the freezing point of water, right? And so, um, you know, there's very high elevation there in the in the Himalaya, and so as long as the as long as the temperature remains below freezing, then uh, we wouldn't expect, even with global warming, that that there would be loss of of ice. But in fact, now uh, in these in these recent papers that have come out, some of them even in the last few months, it's it's becoming clear that while there is uh, heterogeneity, while there there are areas that are growing in the Himalaya, uh, much of the much of the ice is being lost. The trends, many of the trends, are negative uh, in that in that region. Uh, and, and as as was mentioned, the the downstream, the, the, you know, the fraction of the population that lives downstream from the from the um, Greater Himalaya globally is is huge. You know, greater than forty percent of the population globally lives downstream from that 
from that region, and many of those of those uh, basins are are uh, dependent on that that uh, snow and ice melt. There is a cool feature for those um, high altitude glaciers as well. We, we never worked it into the film, but. Um, the ice can actually uh, just evaporate. It doesn't actually turn into liquid state. It goes from solid to gas, and it creates these formations that are gorgeous. I think they're called penitent penitentes or something like that. Um, and they create, they're like these spikes and jagged edges uh, all across the glacier. And we've seen them in uh, Bolivia and some other places as well. They're, they're truly remarkable. I'm aware of the time. We have time for one more question, so you're the lucky. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, great film. Uh, I just was was curious, uh, I think the visualization of the ice melting sort of does its own convincing in a lot of ways, and I think it's a really great uh, sort of converse to the misinformation that we were talking about earlier, because uh, you get to see it, it has a value in both scientific, art, uh, just uh, emotionally, and I was just sort of curious uh, if there were other projects going yeah. on that you knew about that were using that, or yeah. again, we've talked about this a little bit, of stepping it up using uh, multiple point or 3D modeling or satellite right. technology or any, any sort of uh, using that same sort of time lapse idea yeah, to, yeah. Um, uh, when James started this project, it was kind of with the realization that uh, when he was at these locations in Iceland, the end of the glacier was this very visual representation of how the planet is changing. That was the first place back in 2006 or so when he realized that he can photograph climate change. Um, inherently, this is an invisible subject, right? This is temperature changing and gases changing in the air, and how do you make that visual? So for James as a photographer, he was trying to figure that out. Um, and back then, there, he couldn't figure out any other real ways to do it. Um, now that we've spent you know, over six years on this project, um, the time-lapse record is continuing. We currently have 30, um, I think 34 cameras at 16 glaciers. He's installing more in South America and in Antarctica. Um, but he's, his, he's also documenting other consequences of man-made climate change that are not ice-related. So one of the big things is pine beetle kill. Um, if you guys are familiar with that, these beetles aren't dying in the winter like they used to. The temperatures aren't cold enough for them to freeze and die in the winter. So their populations are, are rising. The trees have a weakened, effectively like a weakened immune system because of higher temperatures in the summer added to drought uh, effects. So now between the beetles and the trees, these populations of beetles are just devastating millions of acres of trees all around the, the Rockies, the West, and up into Canada. So James has time lapses of green, lush, vibrant trees. Over the course of three months, you watch them go from green, lush trees to red and dead. And there's something even more powerful, I, I think there's something more powerful in those time lapses than in the glacier photography. Because people aren't used to how glaciers move. I mean, when you watch the glacier time lapses, you're first figuring out what you're seeing and what's going on. And when you see a tree kind of turn around that quickly, as a result, you're being told as a result of climate change, that is something that has major impact. Um, he's photographing advancing deserts. Um, he's looking into photographing uh, coral reefs and acidification affecting reefs. So we're learning more and more as the science is getting stronger how these man-made consequences are, um, are kind of reacting in very visible ways. Uh, and James is starting to figure out how to use the technology, ad adopt the technology to document them. Obviously, these are very, very expensive installations. All the travel and all the equipment was very expensive to make the project happen in the first place. And then you have to like set the camera up and wait for multiple years. So all of those things don't lend to a very easy project. You have to make sure that you're setting up something in the right place that's going to last a long enough period of time to capture something that's actually telling a story. Um, you know, that, that kind of feeds back into the fact that these glaciers, you know, glaciers have been changing for long periods of time. They've always been changing. They've always been coming and going. So the time lapses in, of them, in and of themselves are representing just a snapshot in time. And it's a representation of what the scientific body has amassed and what the scientific community has been telling us. So that's, that's kind of how we look at the time lapses and the calving events. This is a, really a, a supporting network for this incredible body of work that the scientific community has been trying to tell everybody. Uh, we're just trying to figure out how to visualize it. Thank you, audience. Audience, thank you, panelists.